please welcome Lafayette College President Daniel Weiss. Lafayette Student Government Viable economic future. 
He continues to pull from his vast foreign policy experience, advising President Obama on a variety of international issues, and representing the U.S. to many regions of the world. When making a comment about Vice President Biden, President Obama said that the best thing about Joe is that when we get everybody together, he really forces people to think and defend their positions, to look at things from every angle. As citizens and members of the community of learning that is Lafayette, we should all appreciate this outlook on learning and problem solving. And now it is my distinct privilege and high honor to introduce to you the Vice President of the United States of America, Mr. Joseph R. Back 
as a united country. The Transcontinental Railroad had been completed just six years before my great-grandpa enrolled here in Lafayette. The beginning of the 19th century, it could take 10 days to get from here to Washington, D.C. on horseback. By the time he arrived on campus, the time the school year was over, it took less than four days to go from New York City to San Francisco. Other great changes were underway as well, changes which no one I would posit in my great-grandfather's enrolling class could have imagined the consequences of. The telephone was invented the year he began at Lafayette. Thomas Edison unveiled the incandescent light bulb a few years after that, and just before my great-grandfather's sons, my great-great-uncles enrolled here, Ford Motor Company was founded. Not long after they got here, the Wright brothers took their first flight. It's highly improbable that my grandfather or anyone who enrolled in 1875 could have understood the far-reaching consequences of these incredible changes for America and the world, and America's place in the world. Not while he was studying engineering at his desk in South by the light of kerosene land. Not when the only way to contact his parents was to go home or to send a letter. And although he probably got here on the train from Scranton Easton, he most assuredly walked from the station to the campus on foot or in a horse-drawn carriage. He couldn't have imagined that 30 years later, as a state senator in Harrisburg, he could pick up a thing called a telephone and call home to Scranton. Again, I don't believe anyone pictured or understood how consequential these changes would be for America, and again, I emphasize, in the world. What I have to say to you tonight is that your generation, that your generation will witness even more extraordinary changes than his did. Times you're living through are just as consequential, and I would argue actually more consequential, than the times my great-grandfather enrolled here in Lafayette. Since you've been born, you students here, until today, the world has fundamentally changed. One of my favorite poets, and my uncle, Edward Blewett Finnegan, named after my great-grandfather, taught me to read was William Butler Yeats. And in his poem written called Easter Sunday, 1960, he used a line in that poem to describe his Ireland after the first rising in the 21st century, in the 20th century. But those black lines is more appropriate, I would argue, to the United States and the world today, even than it was to his Ireland in 1960. And the line is, all has changed, changed utterly. Terrible beauty has been born. Folks, the change that occurred from the time you were born to the time you arrived in this campus is nothing compared to the change that's going to occur from the time you leave this campus till you are 30 years at your 30 year class reunion. It will change utterly again. It will be equally as profound as the changes that occurred since you've been born. And the challenges that this change has brought present us with an extraordinary opportunity. Not just age, an extraordinary opportunity. If we're both smart and tough, not just tough, smart and tough, we have a chance help shape a new world, a new era in international relations. Imagine a world where America is respected not only for the example of its power, but for the power of its example. Exhorting and ex extending the kind of leadership that persuades, persuades others to join us and help carry their fair share of the international burdens of the 21st century. Imagine a world in which our traditional alliances in Europe and Asia are strong, even as we build practical partnerships with emerging countries like Russia, China, India. Ladies and gentlemen, those partnerships, those relationships 
and have the opportunity to advance America's interest around the world. Imagine a world in which Al-Qaeda, which has changed the course of our country the last decade, is relegated to half a chapter in the history books that your children, your children will study. Imagine a world whose major powers, including the United States, rely less and less on nuclear weapons. Countries joining force to keep nuclear materials out of the hands of non-state actors. And countries with nuclear programs that challenge world peace and stability finally relinquishing them. Imagine a world in which the least fortunate among us have full access to food and energy and water, increasing their human dignity and decreasing the prospects of war. Imagine a world where individual freedom is possible for everyone and liberty is widely shared. Imagine a world in which there are fewer nuclear armed nations rather than more. Now that's the world the President and I not only imagine, it's a present of the world that we believe. Believe if we're smart, if we're tough, that we can eventually help make possible. Because it's essential that we do. If we use not only our hard power, but our soft power, the totality of American power. And that's what we're doing right now, not only in dealing with Al-Qaeda, but in promoting the rule of law overseas, as well as the rule of law here by ending torture and other devices that have been used in the past, setting the example for the world. That's why we focus so much on world hunger and on the innovation front. Just as my great-grandfather couldn't imagine the consequences of the technological changes that were taking place in his time, I don't believe any of us can fully comprehend the incredible consequences of the changes that are in train now and those that will occur in the very near future. For I believe we are at the cusp in this nation of breakthroughs that, in my view, aren't just possible but inevitable. Breakthroughs that have the potential to transform the world we live in. Imagine when we develop, not if we develop, when we develop solar power, this is cheap as coal. Imagine what it will mean. Imagine what it will mean to have smart anti-cancer drugs that attack tumors and leave healthy cells untouched. Imagine what it will mean in the near term when scientists are able to regrow damaged organs, eliminating the agonizing weight of organ transplants, or worse, never having the opportunity. Imagine the consequences of our ability to sequence the entire human genome for individuals in under an hour, delivering rapid, personalized medicine. Imagine what we're we'll able to do when we have a supercomputer capable of performing a million trillion calculations per second, which is 100 times faster than the fastest computer on Earth today. Folks, these are not my dreams. As we speak, leading scientists in America and educators are working on all of what I just said. It's all within our reach. Educators are working on a program called Education Dominance, whose goal is to allow our military personnel to acquire technical skills in months instead of years. Right now, scientists are within reach of developing electronic vehicles that can go 300 miles with a single plug-in. And you speak to these young, brilliant scientists in the National Laboratories, and they tell you that's only the beginning. They believe, they believe that they'll be able to do that with a single charge taking you a thousand miles. This is work being done right now. If I took you to the National Laboratories across this country, it's within the range of the possible. And all these potential changes have profound implications for our society. But here's the catch. Here's the difference between my great grandfather, grandfather, father's generation, even mine, and yours. The rest of the world is awakening. The rest
rest of the world is waiting for you. Other major countries in the world are in the same hot pursuit of each of those outcomes. You see it in China, India, Brazil, and other countries making massive investments in significant portions of the GDP and development infrastructure, research, innovation, education. One thing that's absolutely clear to me, and I respect the suggestion to clear to all of you, we will either lead in the 21st century or we will follow. We'll either lead or we will follow. There is no standing still. That is the choice before us. There isn't anything between. That's why we can't shrink from all the approach that always define us as a people. It matters. Whatever country is the first to make a solar panel and a chip that's as cheap as coal is going to dominate the energy market for a generation to come. Whatever country finds the breakthrough for cancer will not only save hundreds of billions of dollars and millions of lives. In the United States alone, we spend $125 billion a year in treating cancer. Imagine, imagine the economic consequence, not only to individual expenditures, but to Medicare and Medicaid, if we find Just imagine. The President and I are absolutely convinced that we're better positioned than any nation in the world to be the dominant economy in the 21st century. And that's not based on American chauvinism. It's based on knowing the history and the journey of this country. We're better positioned because, primarily because we have the most receptive environment for innovation and the most productive workers in the world. As old Walter Brennan used to say in that TV show, that ain't brag, man, that's just fact. That is a fact of life. That's a fact of present day life. But it precariously held on to By any measure, we're the most innovative nation in the world. Eight million patents, information technology, high tech company, company Microsoft, Intel, Google, Apple, Oracle, IBM. There's nothing to guarantee. To guarantee that we'll remain in that position. I realize I may be accused of American exceptionalism, but I make no apologies for saying that I believe there's a uniqueness of America that nurtures this innovation. It's not because we are naturally brighter, it's not because Americans are brighter than people in China or Europe or anywhere in the world. But this is the one country in the world where everybody Literally everybody has high expectations. Just think about that for a second. Many of you travel the world. The expectations of America, whether they're rich or poor, are high for themselves, for their children, for their nation. It's these expectations, in my view, that fuel and nurture an environment in which creative minds venture to do what people say is impossible. The environment I speak of is one where we have the finest research universities in the world, the finest university system in the world, an education system with all its faults, but from the very outset that promotes and rewards students who challenge orthodoxy. Name me another country where that is promoted this is not new. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Emerson in his essay to the American scholar in 1860, said, and I quote, meek young men, grow up in library. Meek young men, grow up in library. Believing in their duty to accept the Jews from Cicero, Bacon, Locke, and Foster. Forgetful that Cicero, Bacon, and Locke only young men in libraries when they wrote these works. It's stamped into our DNA to challenge orthodoxy. That's how progress occurs. We don't forget. In addition, we're in an intellectual environment where you can breathe free 
where speech is not cabined, where authority does not dictate. In the words of Steve Jobs, when a young man asked him in a lecture, I believe it was a Stanford, but I'm not certain where it was. He said, Mr. Jobs, what, what do I need to do to be able to emulate what you did? He looked at the kid and he said two words, think different. Think different. Change, real change, real breakthrough only comes, can only occur in a country where you can breathe free, where there's absolute free speech. Only in a country where orthodoxy is challenged is a, is a basic premise. It's viewed as a virtue, not a crime. I think it's really a pretty good description of America. One thing the challenges of late have done, they have awakened us out of our lethargy. <coughs> Complacent. When I tell people, even to this day, we rank 16th in the world in the percent of population we graduate from college, they're incredulous. Because when I started college, we ranked first in the world. And for much of my adult life, it's hard for me to believe. But the giant has been awakened. We cannot rest on our laurels. That's the good thing that's occurred as a consequence of these challenges. Because everybody basically knows if you don't move forward, you're standing still. If you're standing still, you're losing. That's why the president and I believe we have to redouble our commitment and reinvest in education. How is it possible? How is it possible? For us to lead the world in the 21st century and rank 16th in the world. How is that possible? How is it possible to meet the expectations of the American people without nurturing early education? Early education. forming primary and secondary school in America and investing in the teachers who teach our children. How is it possible? How is it possible? But quite frankly, if we do all that, that's not enough. It's necessary, but not sufficient. That loan will not allow us to maintain the innovative edge that we have had and are on the cusp of being challenged. We have to continue to make possible, if possible, to maintain the most extensive venture capitalist system in the world. Investors ready to make a bet, even when the odds are long, on breakthrough technologies and capacities and capabilities. That's how Google got started. They got their seed money from Silicon Valley capitalists who took a risk. That's how Apple did it, and countless others that I could name. Another reason why innovation has flourished in America is because entrepreneurs, investors, and those with creative minds have known and know from the outset, they know with certainty that their ideas and their innovations will be protected under our patent laws as well as by our courts. Intellectual property will be protected. Something that's been in my bailiwick for the last 30 years and now as Vice President, intellectual property, better protected than any place in the world. A court system, a court system that every investor, foreign and domestic, knows can be trusted to adjudicate differences. The contracts will be protected, and commitments kept. The key to success in the 21st century for American business was their willingness, whether they were large or small, to make significant investments in research and development. Bell Labs, Abbott Labs, so many others. That's why the President and I have been pushing to make permanent the R&D tax credit for companies 